know we're on Facebook and uh, well, not yet Facebook. They've they kicked us off. Well, we're working on live is the Auto Hub Show, changing automotive one show at a time with Ian and Jeff. And here we go. <laughs> an old dog new tricks. Hi, I'm Gail Rubenstein, the founder and CEO of a company called Retail Resilient Social Selling for the Car Industry. And we help auto dealers, auto agencies, and vendors in the auto industry sell more cars, service more cars, and make more money using our social selling strategy. That includes TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and anything else you can think of. So if you're looking to invest thousands and make millions, we're definitely the social selling company for you. Like I said, who said you can't teach an old dog new tricks? <laughs> if you run a service drive, you know these days, first impressions matter. But when your advisors are tied up with inbound phone calls, they tend to neglect their other, more important duties. And did you know, 75% of all service calls are frequently asked questions in routine requests. Still, the average dealer misses up to 30% of inbound calls, adding up to a ton of missed service opportunity and increased customer churn. 68% of callers actually go elsewhere if they can't get through, which means you could be losing sixty dollars to $70,000 every month in service revenue simply from missing calls. So who will pick up? Introducing Brooke. Hi there. Your best service scheduling assistant. Brooke is the first intelligent digital voice assistant to answer, handle, and appoint all of your inbound service calls. Hiring Brooke means absolutely no call goes unanswered, boosting your customer satisfaction and reducing your overhead costs. And talking to Brooke is like talking to a friend with human level understanding in a friendly conversational voice. Her conversational intelligence is built on millions of actual service industry conversations, making her the easiest onboard you'll ever have. She can handle any volume of calls and follows your policies every step of the way, 24 seven. That means even when the lights are off, Brooke is always on. And I can do it without missing a beat. You really do check all the boxes. Book with Brooke today. Visit brook.ai or call 866-942-1236. Finally, the perfect match. See that light above the bathroom door over there? That's a big time saver for our technicians and other recon staff. The light goes on when the bathroom is occupied. Now techs keep working until the light goes out. Then they know for sure the room is empty. And when they're busy there, they're also catching up on the news. Not bad news, but news they need for the job. I post these where they can't be missed. Too often, the search for the right product for valuable time. This inexpensive detailer's car organizes supplies. Now techs lay their hands on what they need without delay. We got these time savers from Rapid Recon, the reconditioning software company that's always defining better reconditioning solutions for dealerships like yours. When the goal is to get cars through recon in 72 hours or less, Every step, every minute, every better decision made helps towards that goal. For more recon efficiency ideas like these, talk to the recon experts at rapidrecon.com. Special thank you to all our sponsors that make the Auto Hub Show possible. Just in case you weren't aware, we are rolling into a new year soon and we are looking for new sponsors. So if you want to grow your business with the Auto Hub Show, just obviously reach out to Jeff or myself and we're happy to answer sponsorship questions. We will have a new media kit out soon, which will have updated data on the results. Let's see here. What is going on with this day? Second here. All right. So three books. Uh, in Defense of Troublemakers, The Power of Dissent in Life and Business, Professional Troublemaker, The Fear Fighter 
Manual and then Trailblazer with Mark Benioff, uh, CEO and founder of Salesforce, if you're not familiar. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to our very special Labor Day show, and uh, which is about trailblazers and troublemakers. And uh, I have to say the first people that went to work after Labor Day became a big deal were real trouble trailblazers and troublemakers. So, of course, uh, seeing as how we're talking about troublemaker shows, we want to talk, discuss our disclaimer. And, of course, the views and opinions of those mentioned here on the show are those that are of our guests and not necessarily of that of myself, Jeff Polo, Ian Nethercott, or, of course, the Auto Hub show. And yeah. we'll have to update this slide since I've redone the website. So if you haven't checked out our website, I've been doing a little bit of work on it. Lots of change. So I'll be updating this slide for next, next week. And we're talking about trailblazers and troublemakers. That's the topic today. So let me stop the share here. If I can do that. How do I do that? One second. Uh, stop share. So well, go ahead, Jeff. The awkward uh, silence there. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, today we have a very interesting show with us. Um, again, it's Labor Day, and um, I'm going to ask everybody that joined us today. We did specifically have Ray Gill joining us from Impel, which uh, used to be Spin Car, which used to be something else. And uh, <laughs> I get dizzy thinking about the stuff they do. And um, uh, Ray, uh, I, I'd like to, you to introduce yourself, but then also uh, we asked you to join the show because you represent change in the car business. So why do you feel you personally qualify as a troublemaker, trailblazer, and um, for your company? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, uh, Jeff and Ian. Super excited. Um, so yeah, like you guys mentioned, my name is Ray Gill. I am the uh, executive sales manager here at Impel, and I manage uh, essentially all of our sales across Canada. So um, my main goal and objective is to scale and grow the company, acquire more dealers um, for the Canadian market, which is extremely important for uh, Impel because I always look at the Canadian market as a year or two years behind what's happening in the U.S. And I think it's safe to say in the U.S., if you look at digital merchandising and the way that they, um, you know, handle inventory for, for uh, dealer websites, it's more of a must have rather than a nice to have for something like an interactive 360. So that's why I think, you know, for myself in Canada and being the representative for Impel, that really gives me the opportunity to be a trail trailblazer or, or a troublemaker because I'm going to be able to bring a completely different, more transparent, more engaging uh, way to merchandise your vehicles online and really get away from the, tr the traditional photo galleries that, you know, we've had in place and dealers have had websites. And then, like you mentioned, we've gone through a rebrand here at Spin Car under now known as Impel. And the reason for that is um, we now have a full suite of conversational AI solutions. So the original name Spin Car, that was really focused on our bread and butter at that time, which was digital merchandising and interactive 360 walkarounds. But now with the whole conversational AI um, solutions, now we've rebranded to become Impel as a full digital engagement platform, which has merchandising to wow a customer when they come to your website, and then sales AI to actually engage and respond to those customers when they're in shopping, service AI to keep following up with those customers once they've purchased a vehicle to maximize that lifetime value. And then we also have an FNI AI, which can help maximize that very, very important piece of the business and uncover new profits and opportunities. So all of that definitely gives me an opportunity to bring a full suite of unique solutions to the Canadian marketplace and just help dealers, you know, make their businesses and websites that much more efficient. Cool. Terrific. I think you gave us a new uh, acronym. I'm very impressed. F and I AI. <laughs> hey. Yeah, there we go. And, uh, and Larry is cloned himself. Oh, sorry, Ian, He's in two squares. Larry's got two squares now. <laughs> Yeah, well, speaking of troublemakers, before we introduce Larry here, we're going to introduce Harry, because once Larry gets started, nobody can shut him up. No, I'm just kidding. Larry. Um, joining us also is Harry Wilner. Uh, funny enough, he's associated with uh, Career Changers uh, USA, maybe Canada, maybe the world, maybe the universe. Um, good friend of the show, Harry Wilner, say hi uh, and tell us, uh, well, you know, we you definitely represent change in the car business because you're you're somebody from the good old days to somebody from the new days. And uh, 
Why do you think you would qualify as a troublemaker other than knowing knowing Feldman? Why did I consider myself a troublemaker? I always spoke out. I didn't keep quiet. And I changed. Our business changed over the years from one thing to the next. We stayed with the market where we can make money. And after 40 years in the business, I've seen everything. Um, it's just the changes are rapid, more rapid than they are. They were years ago. They're extremely rapid right now. And uh, it's an amazing industry. Anybody's frightened to get into it is crazy. Um, <laughs> everybody that stays in it for 40 years is probably crazy also. But that's why I'm a troublemaker. And then, then, I, then I associate it with Larry, and that's a whole other set of troubles. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining you know, us. We really appreciate Ray, it. Ray, just so you know what I did, I, I ran an automobile leasing company for 40 years. We leased mainly the last seven, eight years, we leased mainly to the rental car industry around the country. And before that, we were in the high line used. We did B and C leasing to credit challenged people, executives, especially with Benz's, Porsches, Ferraris, and all that good stuff. Right. We had an equipment leasing company. So I've sort of seen all of it in this industry. Ran a portfolio that was fifteen million dollars at the end, and then well, it's very kind of funny that you. It's funny that you mentioned the uh, credit challenge and then mentioned executives. <laughs> People never understand that art in the car business how so how hard it is to get executive level people financed, and everybody thinks, oh, these shooters with their Ferraris, their Porsches, and everything, they're just big shots and running around throwing away cash. Nah. -uh. There's, a, there's always a story behind them. <laughs> always a story. Always a story. And last but not least, we have a Larry Feldman who has decided to give us two tiles of himself here because he's uh, just that uh, important with Career Changers USA. Uh, Larry, uh, you know you don't have to tell anybody that knows you why you're a troublemaker, but um, why, do you, <laughs> why are you a trailblazer? And you're muted. You're still muted. You're, You're muted, muted Larry. Larry. <laughs> That's why he's a drone. Right left hand corner. <laughs> okay, there we there go. There we go. <laughs> Ray, as, as you can see, and it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, because I'm I'm shy and reticent, I'm constantly a target of derision. Um, I am not often given credit for helping reform the prison system in Canada, which is how uh, Jeff and Ian were able to get out and put on this show and and thank God we've given parolees a second chance. Um, apparently they, uh, I don't know if you know it, they went to jail for killing some uh, guests that were not entertaining. So I try to do my best to stir the pot every chance I get. Uh, as far as why uh, I'm a trailblazer, um, I, I believe uh, I invented early management intervention. And what I, what I would do is I would, and my managers would cringe when I first started in the business, I would walk up to my managers who had a look of terror in their eyes and say, this guy really made a lot of money last year. Can we overcharge him for the car to help with his tax mitigation? Of course, the guy would say, I didn't say, shut up. The manager was, but guess what? They were all laughing and I broke down all those walls and all those barriers. And I've always been a believer from a young age that short visit on earth, why not turn up the volume or why not have some fun? And if you're not going to have fun, why show the hell up? <laughs> That's it. Exactly. And you know, as my hero, Ben Franklin, always says, when you're finished changing, you're finished. Exactly. So, and every day you should get up. You should try to learn something. You should try to have a little fun. Um, and that's it. Other than that, I have uh, very little to contribute. Um, uh, the reason there's two squares is I tried to get on from my other new incredibly expensive fancy computer and it refused to let me be heard, which might have been Ian's doing. <laughs> Ian's a very good home manipulator, be careful. Um, so I, uh, not willing to give up, I tried, uh, I tried this. Okay. That's all. If I can get four more squares on, we can get rid of Ian, right? That's what you were talking about last night when you were drunk, right, Jeff? Yeah. Yep. So it's like Hollywood squares. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Larry. So every day we hear about a new type of disruption in business, EVs, retailing, OEMs, even virtual business. In your eyes, what the heck is going on? Uh, let's start with Larry, Harry on this. EVs, my favorite subject. 
It's nice that California wants to have everybody driving an EV by 35. Meanwhile, they're telling people, oh, you can't charge your cars, but don't have enough electric. <laughs> Tell me where it's going to go. And I saw yesterday or the day before there was an article about Buick is offering to buy dealerships back now because yeah. they're going strictly EV. Um, I'm an old school guy. I would never drive an EV. Nobody talks about where that power is coming from. Oh, a coal-fired plant that power came from? <laughs> Nobody talks about, oh, your $15,000 battery in the car when it's out of warranty? Oh, where are you going to put the batteries? <laughs> I, I think our eyes need to be opened about EVs totally. I am not convinced about EVs at all. I do have to interject for a moment. In the words of that great British philosopher, Bond, James Bond, never say never. <laughs> hey, listen, I got in the industry before we had fax machines. You ever had to call your credit apps in. <laughs> Ray, you're way too young to remember those days. <laughs> the, the reason <laughs> you, you, I don't mean to correct you, my good and great friend, Mr. Polo, but you were incomplete in the title. It was never say never again. <laughs> and, and the lesson there, if you don't mind me uh, building on what you said, was Sean Connery, like any actor, or I guess any person, doesn't want to be branded as one thing, right? We all like to think that we're multifaceted. It's why every actor wants to play basketball and every athlete thinks he can sing. Um, and he refused to do the role till they waved a big enough check in front of him. It always comes down to money and economics. And this is the biggest travesty that I think any business person has ever seen because every single thing is built on a fallacy. The, the polluters, the primary polluters on the planet are China and India. If we completely stopped every single thing that produced any bit of emission right now, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference because it's China and it's India. Then we look at the economics of it and realize that everything they're trying to do and build on revolves around us buying things from China and building up an economy which wants to oppress their people, put the Uyghurs in concentration camps, and, and take over the world. So you, you've got a bunch of, I, I won't call them brain dead because I don't want to get any letters from the anti-brain dead defamation league, <laughs> but you've got a bunch of morons that, uh, California, every time I turn on the TV, other than seeing this idiot with the haircut governor, is people <laughs> fleeing for their lives from a fire. I can just see that the house is on fire. Well, let's stop and charge the EV. It should only take about three days. <laughs> every single premise is built on a fallacy. It's a joke. It's not going to happen. It can happen. I, I believe, uh, Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the stat guy, 16% of the cars um, in, in California are electric. And I, you both were correct in saying that they've come up with, well, do not charge your cars between here and there. What are they going to do when it's 100%? Wow. It makes no sense. The, the Every single aspect of it is ridiculous. Is completely crazy, um, but once again, this is what happens when in your wonderful country you have who you have leading you, and in our country we have who we are leading you. Ray, you don't know this, but I'm about to move out of the country and take the condo in the Caribbean that Cher never moved into when Trump was elected. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you saw that Ozzy's selling his house in L.A. because he's worried about taxes and gun crime. <laughs> that was interesting. Ozzy Osbourne. Anyway, Ray, what do you think? Yeah, I think that it's a very interesting topic on the EV side because it actually, and you know, if you tie it into the real estate situation in Canada, it's almost impossible for people in Vancouver, Toronto to own a detached house. So all those people are moving into higher density condos. And we know that the majority of these high density condos aren't being built with charging infrastructure. Or if they do have chargers, there's like, five or 10 in a building. So now you have another problem tied into our real estate issues of how are all these people going to charge their vehicles when they all live in high density um, buildings. And then another <laughs> thing when it, when it comes to costs and infrastructure is roads are mainly financed by fuel taxes. 100%. So now that the EVs are coming out, like in Vancouver, as an example, you have the city council and mayor doing studies on uh, road ch road uh, tax systems where you're going to be charged to come into downtown and they're already trying to figure out ways to okay hey we all went green we all got the evs we're not polluting anymore but now we're going to have another tax on top of us because 
everything still needs to flow and everything still needs to function. So, you no, know, there's a big protest in in Paris uh, this week when people who have motorcycles who only have motorcycles because they can't afford to drive cars are now being taxed to come into the city. And they had people who are very angry going, hey, man, if I could afford a car, I'd have a car. I have a motorcycle because I can't afford it. Now you're telling me I got to pay. I can't afford to pay. So it was kind of interesting. But more importantly, when we had that, we did an interview with Brian Benstock. He was talking about New York City. He says, yeah, I'd have to sell a 300-foot extension cord with each EV that I sold Manhattan. That was pretty well, funny. the harbinger of that, uh, Ian and, and Ray, was a, a couple years ago when they, the Democrats in my fine country started to talk about a mileage tax, taxing you on how much you drive. Um, it, it, it's just so insidious because forget the fact that people are trying to completely control our lives, what, what they're doing makes no sense. Anybody, again, anybody with any logical attachment to the world knows that what moves the world is trucks. So to make it in completely incomprehensibly inexpensive to drive them, to move them, and then to get taxed on top of them, it, 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 you know, if this was, if we took a step back, and we went to see a movie based on this. We'd walk out and say, oh, it was surreal. It was too unrealistic. Nobody would be this foolish in terms of running a country or, or two countries. <laughs> Jeff? I think we all need to go back. All need to go back to our children as, as child. And we watched Fred Flintstone. Stone Age had good cars. Your feet. <laughs> no fumes. Harry, this is why they fired you at Buick from your design team. <laughs> Jeff? Well, you know, so the question also was retailing styles and OEM. So we touched on Buick trying to change things and, uh, you know, virtual business and everything else. So we, how does somebody go, and all these guys are being become, are becoming troublemakers. Man, this is my one trip on my tongue today. Um, how does one become a troublemaker without becoming a pariah? And so, actually, speaking of pariahs, no, no, I don't want to start with Larry because that'll start a whole other thing. But what the hell, Larry? Go for it. Sure. There, there's as much as uh, I admire the French for um, bringing us the Statue of Liberty, but then being cowards in every single thing. Uh, Churchill had to sink their fleet because they were going to turn it over to the Nazis. Um, the French did have a saying: um, "If you want to be a, be right, don't be afraid to be lonely." Because if you think about it, anything that's ever been accomplished has been accomplished by people willing to stand up and speak their mind. Um, I'm an American, uh, and America was formed, and this is really, thank you for the salute, sir. Um, America was formed to rebel against people controlling our lives, taxation without representation. Um, it's why Washington refused to be king. He said, we just got rid of the king. Um, but everything starts with somebody saying, I'm going to try it. You want a troublemaker? How about Henry Ford? Uh, how many people said, ah, this is ridiculous. Uh, you're never going to replace a horse. Um, uh, Ray, I don't know if you know this. Um, as whacked as I am, and I'm an extensive reader, and I've read a lot on Henry Ford, the anti-Semitic bastard. Um, and, and he did something. When you think of him, you think of, oh, he, he came up with these incredible systems. Um to expand uh, American technology and then world technology. What you may not know is you talk about a radical within a radical, he raised his wages. And every other business person said, you can't do that, that's ridiculous. He said, I want the people that build my cars to be able to afford my cars. So, and I, I swear I'll shut up after this. Uh, many years ago, I had a radio um, show that, to talk about my Cadillac Hyundai dealership. And my, my last guest, uh, boy, was it fun, was Ralph Nader. Um, and Ralph Nader basically said that, that people know who their sports teams are, um, but they don't know who their councilman is, their alderman, their senator. They don't care. So as, to, as per Harry Truman, my favorite politician, we get what we deserve. But let me say this, and I'll shut up about being a troublemaker. In the early 60s, I don't know how old you are, right? Me and, me and Harry are old guys, uh, uh, and Jeff's, uh, Jeff's social security number is 11, so we're not even going to go there. <laughs> he came out with a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, talking about the Corvair. And it basically, it had like 
what looked like the tip of a sword or an arrow coming out. And if you were in an accident, you basically got impaled on your own steering wheel and died. So he wrote this book and he was, man, you would have thought it was like the torches, the, 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 the peasants with the torches going after Frankenstein. How dare you? Because back then the classic slogan was, as General Motors goes, so goes America. So every business went, you're a communist, it's a disgrace, but okay, let's flash forward. He decides to run for president. Now remember, this is a guy, whether you like him or not, that helped clean up the air, the water, made things safer. You know, you could tell where it logically led to seatbelts and airbags. It really did a lot for the world. He then runs for president. And according to the Democrats, he now siphons off votes for Gore, which allows Bush a pathway to be president. So the same guy that conservatives said was the worst person on earth, now liberals said was the worst person on earth. <laughs> so I guess basically, if you if you look in the mirror and say, I'm gonna make what I say count, I'm gonna roll, you're gonna be a troublemaker. If you believe in Jesus, we're Jewish, we gave it to you, so it's okay. He was a troublemaker. Martin Luther King, Unbelievable troublemaker. If you're going to do something good or great and you're going to do what you believe in, you're going to be a troublemaker. That's it. That's I tried to keep that to 7,000 words. That's my limit. Correct, Jeff? There we go. So, so Ray, we're, we, we're going to get you to follow up on that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, think, I think something that was really interesting that Larry mentioned there is, you know, with, with Ford, when he raised wages, he did something out of the ordinary and kind of set the trends. And then with GM, as GM goes, so goes America. And that was kind of, you know, those big traditional automakers really not just set the tone for the automotive industry, they set the tone for all industry in the US in general. But now if we look at the market now, there's a new player, Tesla. Everyone is now trying to react and become more of a Tesla. And Jeff, like you mentioned, Buick's offering to buy out dealerships that don't want to invest and put in the EV infrastructure. They're all trying to become more of the direct to consumer, taking more control of the supply chain and essentially replicating the Tesla model. So now all of a sudden, you know, the GMs, the Fords of the world that used to be the trailblazers are now all trying to just copy the Tesla model, who is ultimately the biggest, you know, trailbla trailblazer in the space now. By the way, Ray, is Tesla I was, opening up dealerships. Uh, yeah, by the way, Ray, um, think about how brilliant your point was, because Tesla fits right in with Ralph Nader. Because every liberal in the world, I want an electric car, I want to save the environment, until he decided to move to Texas and, and say, vote Republican, now he's the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 to, and to echo, uh, Larry, with your, uh, with your uh, wage discussion, there's a gentleman out of um, Seattle. He has a payment company, I believe. And he raised all the minimum salaries of the company to 70000 or more. And people said he was nuts. They said, what are you doing, dude? Like, you're paying people too much. And it, it's been really interesting to see what happened with that company. But go ahead, Eric. Oh, you know what uh, happened with that guy? That guy's about to be indicted. That guy, yeah. no, not being a smart aleck, that guy ran into some kind of problems with sexual harassment oh, and, really? and, and diverting funds. Ray, there's a reason I get too square. I honestly have correct and It's very sad. Luckily, the Canadian <laughs> government subsidizes. They, they, they send a moose to the house once a month. It's very interesting. <laughs> Harry? I don't even know what to say to Larry. <laughs> try, try being in the car with him for a 10 hour ride to Indiana. <laughs> oh. So oh, I, you I know. really hate to see, I really hate to see Larry driving through a Democratic state. <laughs> oh my golly, gee willikers. You know, the, 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 it's, it's right back to Jesus. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. <laughs> you know, the domestic manufacturers, we all know they're way behind the times. They all screw up everything. I mean, what happened when Saturn came out? It's the newest way to sell a car. One price sell. How'd that work out, for General Motors? Uh, now, Buick's going to look. It appears Buick's going to go away. Um, I think if dealerships don't step up and start fighting, there's not going to be a dealership body in the future. The manufacturers are going to own everything. They'll have a delivery set, a center, and they'll have a service center and not need to have a dealership sitting there. Um, 
If I owned a dealership right now, I think I would sell it at the highest point you can right now. Because I think the future is not bright for the dealership body. I really don't see it being that bright. And yeah, you say Tesla, how well they've done and everything else, but that's not a car for the masses. How many people can afford a Tesla today? And and how many how much profit have they really generated? We don't know. Um, exactly right. And if you think about it, let's look at it. Let's flip it on the head of the consumer as well as vendors like myself, like dealers, uh, like people like Jeff, who's in the business, Ian, who's an, an amazing vendor that buys in and consults. It's not going to be good for anybody because any giant company falls into the same trap that federal governments fall into, which is they're really terrible about taking an overview and making it individual. Uh, anything the government gets involved in gets screwed up. And if you think about these big companies, the disconnect they have from their customers, they like to blame it on the dealers, but it's them. I mean, I, we have enough trouble when you put your arm around your service department of getting a car in or getting it out or making sure they call about the loaner car. Can you imagine them handling it? And by the way, it's, it's even uglier than what you said, because what Buick said was, if you don't want to sell electric cars, then we'll buy your franchise back. What kind of extortion is that? It's like going into a restaurant saying, if you're not going to use this kind of hamburger, we're getting rid of you. But did you notice how much they're offering to pay for a franchise? No, what are they offering? I read that it's between 200 and $500,000 to buy the franchise back. Wow. It's a joke. It's a joke. It, it's it, a joke. Yeah. You know, so meanwhile, AutoNation or uh, up here, uh, Delari or uh, whatever, they're just going to walk in and say, tell you what. You keep the building, we'll rent the building, we'll take the store from you for $5 million. And somebody says, see ya, because they think you're way, the way you do here. Which I don't think is really a wrong thing. Well, also, I mean, what are they going to do in China where Buick is the luxury brand name? Are they going to force the dealers there? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to be very interesting to see. But it's not surprising because based on what Ford's trying, they're doing the same thing. They're they're firing a ball to see what happens. You know, that's the only big one dealer is, well, in China. Hmm? There's only one dealer in China. <laughs> right? Let's be honest here. That's, that's, the, number, that's the number one, one luxury American dealer. brand in China is Buick, ironically, which is quite we're, we're now, Ray, we're now going to detour into talking about a guy from Alibaba who was a zillionaire who disappeared for six months and came back and said, eh, maybe, maybe China's not such a bad place. Or my favorite piece of vermin, LeBron James, who will go on and on about my friend, Mr. Trump, but doesn't describe the Uyghurs and what's happening with them. And the fact that they put the one guy that did stand up out of the league. You know what? The world's doomed. Let's shut off this program and go get some pizza. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's all guys. We can go out and get drunk and get laid. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say laid. Then they'll want to tax that too. You know, you know how the governments are. And of course, we remind you about the disclaimer for the auto show. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. You can blank that comment out. What what it's, is one thing you've accomplished that's that, that disturbs that that disturbs the shit out of you and sets you apart from others? What do you think? Mr. Ooh. Ray. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, our biggest disruption that we've had as a company uh, in the Canadian market was actually just announced recently. Um, and that was with the Delari group that you just mentioned, Jeff. So they've, um, they partnered with us to bring the 360 technology and experience to all their dealerships and websites across the country. And I think that right there is, you know, a signal from the biggest player in the Canadian market that they believe in better merchandising. They believe in the transparency for their websites. And that's kind of that signal to other dealerships that they too need to kind of follow the industry leader. So that would definitely be the biggest disruption um, on my end. And do you see, do you hear a lot of the trailblazer dealers in Canada saying they want to do that? Or are they still taking a wait and see attitude? I think the challenge with any sort of uh, inventory merchandising or inventory marketing solution right now is that we've been in a very abnormal market where literally anyone can sell a car right now. The inventory is just so constrained and the desire to essentially put any more money into merchandising a vehicle is very low. So that's been a little bit of the, the challenge over the last few months, but I think the market is quickly shifting. Um, you know, we're probably gonna get another interest rate rise this week 
0.75, maybe one. So that could put another, you know, pump the brakes a little bit on the market. Used car prices are already declining. Um, the new car supply chain is going to start picking back up. And I think now heading into 2023, you're going to see uh, a big challenge coming up this winter. That's my prediction. And then you're going to see dealerships kind of relook at their strategy and say, okay, the gravy train's kind of slowed down here. We need to get to ba back to basics. We need to figure out how we're going to get a step ahead. The more progressive and um, the more aggressive ones are already doing that right now. They're right. setting the stage for success. The ones that are waiting are going to be the ones that are, you know, all of a sudden have a shitty month and then say, oh, got to all of a sudden invest and do something different. And then you're just playing that catch up game. Right. Ray, you're, I agree with you completely. I think people like you that bring value people like me who I believe bring value in terms of uh, training, we're going to be so busy, we're not going to be able to breathe because they're really, really, instead of saying, boy, we just made three times more than we've ever made in a month, let's be smart and let's take this time while things are really feeling good and there's no stress to build and get better. It's the exact opposite. Customer service is falling down. The attitude's getting twisted and around. Um, it, it, it's yeah, it's, it's going to really be an interesting next 12 months. I think we're all agreeing on that. I have to share something, and I've shared it a few times uh, already about an experience of customer service. And funny enough, we're going to have the Brook AI show coming up later this month, and it's which is about fixed ops. And I had a terrible experience with customer service in my own car. I'm a car guy. I'm in the car business. And I am so pissed at this dealer because I couldn't get a call back. When I, went, when I went to get the car picked up because they wouldn't fix it the way I wanted it, they only wanted to do it the way they said they had to do it, um, I had to phone three times to get somebody to let me pay my bill. You know, that's, that's, that's just ridiculous. But then again, you know, I mean, if I, if I was of a certain demographic that walked into a place and was, was dealing with cash, uh, they'd sell me their $182,000, $120,000 car, no problem. So moving on, pardon me. If Larry's going to get political, I'm going to get ranty. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. So, well, um, I'm going to ask everybody this question. And Larry's already mentioned one, but he's got to find another one. But Ray, name your favorite automotive troublemaker. By the way, the person with the initials EM does not qualify just because we don't want to talk about him anymore. Um, I would say for myself, um, you know, as soon as I got into automotive, I, I took a lot of time just getting on LinkedIn and seeing who was putting out, you know, the most unique content and the most interesting perspectives. Um, Brian Benstock is definitely one of the ones that jumps out and just the way that he runs his dealerships, the focus he puts on customers, the way that he's really adapted for digital retail. I think that was ahead of his time and something that I always, you know, look to see what he's posting and the information and the content he's sharing and another one another brian i think brian pash is another um, very interesting trailblazer just a lot of the work he does in terms of how dealers should be spending their digital marketing budget and the way that he always puts it is very dealer centric it's, it's a lot of the times when you're getting content from a google or a meta they're putting advice in their perspective that's going to make them more money but i find when brian pash puts out research or does any sort of um, studies for dealers, it's always dealer centric and it's always with the idea or intention of making them more efficient or uh, making them, you know, save money in the end of the day. So those would be two that kind of jump out to me. Okay. And can I, can I throw initials at you since you said you, we can't do EM. How about LI? Lee Iacocca. <laughs> Lee Iacocca. Larry. Lee Iacocca went, went against Ford and their egomaniacal ways and push the Mustang, which just completely changed so much about the, the industry. Um, it's crazy. Then because of ego conflicts, he goes to Chrysler and real wakes up and goes, what the hell did I take this job for? Because they invented the concept of just having zillions and zillions of cars and reporting them sold. And they weren't, um, came out with the minivan, Borrowed money. This is a radical concept. He borrowed money from the government and actually paid it back ahead of time and basically saved the company. Now, today it's so diverse and fragmented, it may not mean the same thing. But back then it would have been a hell of a difference. 
for the world's economy in America's if Chrysler had gone bankrupt. Um, so you talk about a troublemaker, a guy that pushed a brand that nobody wanted, that really changed everything for Ford and, and saved Chrysler by by doing a lot of radical things. I mean, you, you may laugh at a soccer mom with a minivan, but boy, you talk about a thing that changed the world. So I, I would throw uh, Lee Iacocca in there with, uh, and he's much more fun to talk to than Ben Stock. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, though, something. If you think about it, he may have pushed that minivan, but in turn, he drove the SUV revolution because, of course, people said, I don't want to drive a minivan. I want to drive an SUV. And if we go back to those two letters, EV, most EVs now are SUVs. So mm -hmm. if we go back, that's a very good person to, to have, uh, have picked there, Larry. Uh, why, you know, remember, it's why I get two blocks. <laughs> there you go. Although I hate to say it now, most people that, that, that view our show and anything, even in the car business, probably don't even know that name. And that's that's because cool. that's because they've heard the quote, and they've heard it mangled. Um, those that forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And when we don't pay attention to what came before us, um, that's why attempts to erase history or alter things are, are so dangerous because life is very cyclical. Business is very cyclical. Um, you know, the Roman Empire would never disappear and, and the sun never, never set on the British Empire. It always becomes the same thing. You get too big, you lose touch with your roots. Um, it's over. It's over. You know, hey, uh, I might be the world's best trainer recruiter. I may have two boxes, but one day, who knows where I'll be. Probably be a lot man for Ray when, you know, when the industry turns around and he buys that Buick dealership for <laughs> but with great with great virtual advertising no I question. Just one out before i go to harry just speaking of troublemakers and an old car old old car guy that maybe people today millennials and gen zers will pick up the name because delorean is back as an ev coming out now. <laughs> so there's where, a name where are the drugs going to gonna be stashed <laughs> yeah. ray, you, ray you seem like the youngest guy on the program delorean um, another guy that came through Ford in the ranks, not a not a smart designer, a brilliant designer, came out with a car that that you know that made Back to the Future more interesting, and decided, you know what, I'm a brilliant designer. I think the next move is supermodels and cocaine. Wound up broke. I'm not sure if he went to jail or not, but you talk about all the way up and all the way back down. There it is. <laughs> None of these guys end up going broke. Come on. Well, look at Fisker with the, the first time he lost billions, and now he's back with another design. He's back so, again. Yeah, interesting. Harry's I was actually amazing. watching a TV show, and uh, it was a Netflix show called Lincoln Lawyer, and uh, the, one of the characters on there actually was driving two different of the new Fiskers that are coming out. So, Harry, Joe, I, I think Larry took my one I want to talk about with Lee Iacocca, but I think Elon Musk needs to be mentioned. Well, he's battling. Can't mention him. <laughs> sorry, <I'm laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> he, he's battling franchise laws in the country, trying to change that. He said, I am not going to have my dealerships be franchised. I am going to own them all. He's built factories using tents and everything else to get cars out the door. I don't know if it's long term or not. We'll see. It seems to be that he's not that interested in that anymore. He's more interested in rockets. I guess he feels he can go to the moon and make some money up there. But look what he's done to the industry. I mean, he brought EVs to a front that we didn't have, really. Yeah, the manufacturers dabbled in it. Nobody has done it like he has done it. 100%. Well, the thing that they did, too, there, and this is what I always say to people, the goal Tesla created things and look at what they created. What they did was they had an electric car that looked really good. And it, you know, even today it stands out because most EVs look like an EV. Yeah. And, and to and take, that and to take the design of Lotus and the engineering and turn that on its head was a smart move to start for sure. I mean, why, yeah. why invent something from scratch when you can modify something that's already one of the best engineered cars out there from a racing perspective? I mean, I think when you look at EV1, which was General Motors' attempt years before because they had to, and you look at what they could have done or even Toyota or Honda could have done if they had continued that, even in a small way, they probably would have been, they wouldn't be as behind as they are today. But what really excites me is you look at the reaction. So you look at 
the the volume of vehicles that are coming i mean whether it's lucid i drove one the other day whether it's from ford or whether it's from uh you know a bunch of other companies I and mean, i think there's the automotive design is going to be a lot more interesting um just because of of what what you can do with that design uh going back to delorean i mean what when you look at gto and those kind of cars i mean what was amazing about him was he was a rock star in design and now there's a lot more interesting things that can be done just with the with a choice of, of combustion engines or choice of power plants i think that's really where the future is going i think you're going to see a, a, a the ability as a consumer to buy different power plants i saw an article this morning before the show um they're going to do a new model uh for renting evs which is kind of interesting uh, but also i wanted to mention jeff um uh, philly philadelphia they're having a state of the union event coming up um and larry i believe is going to be there live with harry uh absolutely so if you are going to be in philly at the state of the union event in philadelphia which is coming up i think next week right yes sir yes so Sunday, definitely, Monday, Tuesday. yeah so definitely make sure to uh um you know meet larry and the boys in person and say hi for jeff and i we didn't have enough notice or we probably would have made an appearance but that was just something i want to mention go ahead jeff yeah, that's, that's one drawback to being based in the west coast of Canada. <laughs> Going to all these big things in the U.S. is, is quite, the, uh, quite the thing. You know, that would be fun, except it, uh, it's an extra day, two days for us from this, our neck of the woods. So let, 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 yeah, you guys just yeah. fly. Yeah. Yeah. For the, uh, so let me ask the, uh, Larry and Harry a question, being that I did my undergraduate degree in Philadelphia. Who makes the best cheesesteak of the two suspects? Never eat one of my life. <laughs> the uh, the best cheese, the best steak you will ever get is not in Philadelphia. It is in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It's something I'm not being facetious. It's called the White House. Oh, okay. It's in Arctic in Mississippi. The guy came back from World War II. You can go there any day of the year, any day of the year, and there's people lined up outside to get takeout. And if you go inside, the first thing you see is the picture of the Beatles, uh, Muhammad Ali, and Joe Frazier. Uh, Sinatra, Elvis Presley, it, it is the best steak sandwich you will ever eat. If you guys eventually ever come to town, I'll take you for a steak sandwich. Rock it off. Jeff and, <laughs> Jeff and Ian, you've both been out with Larry for dinners. You're going to trust him with a food review? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to tell you, though, if you want to know what the best New York deli food is, you got to go to see Harry. <laughs> Through Harry, I got to experience the table. Where Harry met Sally. There you go. Okay. Ray, this is what good. happens when you have a bunch of Jews on. It goes from a car show to a food <laughs> show. <laughs> Ray, I have a question. Can I ask a question to Ray? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're in the tech field. You're young. Where do you see yourself when you're 50 and 60 and the next young whippersnapper, I'm going to use that old fashioned term, comes along? That's a great question. Honestly, I, I put a lot of thought into that. And I think, you know, eventually where I would like to, to go into is taking all this knowledge and expertise within automotive, you know, on the digital marketing side, on the technology side, and hopefully eventually getting to the point where, you know, you can be consulting dealerships and advising them on how they need to transform and how they can manage their marketing budgets and their tech stacks more efficiently. I think that's where I would eventually like to go but as part of that you know you have to stay on your toes you can't let the industry pass you by you have to go to these conferences you have to watch these types of podcasts you have to continuously educate yourself and read otherwise you know if you take a month or two off and kind of get out of it the industry can go five six seven eight months and just overpass you so it's all about continuous learning and just making sure that you're you know trying to be the best version of yourself every day that's a great philosophy for anything, right? That's absolutely. And, the, and of course, the great thing is if you can make it in the bar business, you can make it anywhere because I refuse to see a tougher business where you're pressed on all sides. Your, your own manufacturers, your EOM, you know, original equipment manufacturers are beat you up. The customers are beat up. Uh, the public is yeah. beating you up. You know, I have to tell you, that's a very interesting thing because I'll never forget, you know, when I started in the business, I'm a salesman and uh, selling cars and in comes the boss and the boss has you know this was a toyota dealership he had like 
eight or nine vintage Toyotas, vintage Toyotas are from the 80s. We're talking from the 60s. And they had all this, and he's such a big shot, and oh, he can do whatever he wants. And then as I grew in the business, I discovered everybody's got a boss. And, you know, that's interesting. You, you say you get it from all sides. So you want a dealership. You're the head of auto nation for crying out loud. Well, guess what? You got your board. You got... 25 OEMs or versions thereof. You've got vendors, you've got people, you know, so you may own all these things. Then you've got the software companies that say, you know what? So you don't want to renew. We own your data, but you really own your data, but we own your data, but you own your data. Wow. That's, uh, that's very, very yeah, good. What about that. the ultimate boss, Mrs. Paula? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. She is. <laughs> By the, by the way, if we're, if we're going to go, if we're really going to make this thing make sense, I'll give you another tremendous troublemaker that people don't remember anymore. W. Edward Demings, who went to the, uh, the Japanese and put in the concept of making cars so well that quality control became an insult. Because one of the things that really put a beaten on America was where our philosophy for our manufacturers was ready, fire, aim. People started to realize that, you know what, this is no... Again, I'm, I'm I'm pulling my age rank on you, Ray. When I was when I was a kid, if you said it was built like a Japanese car, it was an insult because they were so cheap. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one day, and American cars were considered inferior to Japanese cars because of the quality of the build. So you got to throw Demings in there if you're talking about a troublemaker and a guy that that changed things around. Yeah, and then you got to look at where the Koreans have come from, where they were yeah. when Hyundai Pony was around. Right? Exactly. I mean, Hyundai Pony for five grand fell apart, man. I mean, I got to tell you something, though. We have to be careful because I caught myself thinking the Koreans are like, like the Japanese. And being involved in a little used car lot, every Korean car we get, and I'm, I really like the cars, you have to check the engine. The second you get it in, you get it into the shop and you get that engine checked. You don't have to do that with a Toyota. You don't have to do that with a Ford other than, a, than an F-150 with a 5.4. You don't have to do that. So, yeah, there we'll use the term troublemaker. There's the Koreans. They became the troublemaker. They turned everything upside down. But sometimes, you know, oh, jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think Hyundai and Kia have come a long way. Yeah, their engines blew if you didn't change the oil every three, four thousand miles. And we leased them as rental cars. Rental car companies don't know what an oil change is. <laughs> but I think if you look at fit and finish and what they put into a car today, Hyundai, and design, I think they're past the Japanese right now. A lot of that. Does anybody say oh. Genesis? How yeah. about Genesis? Not real. I mean, look, look at the new JD Power review on Genesis, and they were comparing it to some heavy hitting, not only American cars or Japanese cars, but even German cars going, eh. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're let's not kid each other about German cars. Sure. They're fun to drive, they look good, they break. Don't buy them used. Yeah. Can't afford to <laughs> fix them, though. Yeah. Hans, Hans oh and Trons are not That's... your buddy in the, in the service department. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, that, it brings up a good EV question with Tesla and there you got to pay for certain services yep. and you buy a used Tesla and you thought it had autopilot and it did. Oh, you got to pay us $10,000 to get that turned on. But that's Where's endemic it? everywhere, Harry. That's Where's BMW, the future of that? You got to pay for your services, seats. the heated seats. That's and endemic to the, the industry. Well, not only that, I talked to a gentleman at Tesla because I was asking about service because there's all this talk about service free and no service needed. And there is actually a coolant service on, I think, Model 3 and Model S and Model Y and, and whatever the other ones are. But the thing that's really interesting is going to be what happens when all these leases start dropping. Like what's going to happen with the value of these cars if, you know, six, eight years down the road or four or five years down the road? That's going to be the big question. But more importantly, when you look at it, when you look at EVs in general, uh, and I looked at a used, I think it was a Hyundai Electric, I don't know which one, whatever, the smaller one. I mean, even used the car was crazy money. So, I mean, I, I just got to look at it from a used perspective and go, okay, when does the math start to make sense? I mean, we were talking on all things used cars, I think it was two weeks ago, about new regulations in the U.S. where they're going to cut back some money to Americans who buy used electric. 
But the bigger question is how many used electric cars are there that are 25,000 US or less? Because one of the guys yeah, on the show was like, becomes hey, a real hey, estate hey. question. Yeah. Because once people can't afford and don't have the electricity to move their car, they'll be living in them, which makes sense because the eviction rate has risen so high. Uh -huh. It's just going to change the whole dynamic. Well, you and me will be in the real estate business, right? Your, your high tech is. <laughs> Condos, I which to introduce my, uh, my new startup called Polo Home Windmills. There we go. <laughs> PoloHomeRentals.com, powered by electricity. No windmills, windmills. <laughs> Everybody's going to have a little windmill on their roof. Well, I saw something this morning. These farmers in Europe are now looking at ways to use solar panels on their orchards and get revenue from the solar panels and reduce the damage to the orchards from the sun. I thought it was really interesting. Anyway, Jeff, yeah, final thoughts? Also, Something else, though, if you go into, now I don't know about the heartland of the U.S., but you drive through Saskatchewan now, and, a, and this is kind of scary because it's neat, but it's scary. A lot of farmers are turning their fields into solar fields. Yeah. And they're not making the wheat. Yeah. And they're just these thousands of acres of solar panels. Very interesting. Uh, gentlemen, we're running out of uh, time here. Uh, uh, final comments, final uh Things we get a little bit off pocket topic, but that's one of the beauties of our show is uh, we start with a topic and then we go wherever our guests go. So um, I will leave Ray. I'm going to leave you for the end because you're the new guy. But right. uh, uh, Larry, we'll get started with you. Just final comments. Yeah, it was Ray. It was a pleasure to meet you. If you'll be kind enough to reach out on LinkedIn, I, I'd certainly like to make a connection with you. Uh, uh, good insights, um, and it was a pleasure seeing everybody as always. And Ray, by the way, Larry and Harry were in Toronto at, uh, at Used Car Week there, but uh, you probably didn't see them. But uh, no, I missed them. Now they were hiding in the vendor booth. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Harry. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, today. It was great speaking to you. Ray, you know, I was always taught we're supposed to leave this world a better place by my parents, my grandparents. We effed you guys up. You're a deep shit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm really sorry. sorry. I'm having <laughs> Harry for gradation because next to like, when he starts speaking, all of a sudden I sound moderate. Very <laughs> unusual. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to tell you something. You brought that up, and before I go to Ray, um, a very uh, well-known in Canada comic, get much more famous in the states, still pretty big, is Russell Peters. And uh, we saw his show not long ago, and he talked about, he remembers talking to his grandmother, and, and he's sitting down, and they're going through the photo album, and, and, you know, she says, I won't use the accent because I don't want to be rude, but says, here's where we came over, and this was your grandfather, and he worked out in the, uh, I can't remember, he's from India, so whatever, the fields, yeah. and he did everything he could, and there we are taking the train to Calcutta where we could get on this boat and we came here and here's our little home when we first got to Canada and here's this and there's the family together and this is where I made the Jesses and this is where I made this and this and this and he says what's going to happen now is, 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 is kids today become grandparents is going to be well there's a picture of me standing in this outfit and there's a picture of me in front of the mirror with that outfit and here's the meal I made and here's what I went to this restaurant so, Ray, I'm sorry, I, I had to bring that up. But, uh, your parting comments, and we greatly appreciate you taking the time, and thanks for joining the Auto Hub family. Ray, parting comments. Yeah, no, it was awesome. I, I really, you know, it was the first time on the show. Had a great time, great conversation. So, really appreciate everyone having me. I guess my uh, last parting comment would be, you know, any sort of change that you have to make always has some sort of financial cost to it and has an expense associated with it but not making the change also has an expense and has a cost. And I think that's something that can be forgotten. So there is a cost to not acting. And I think that in this market and in this industry, you have to be ready to move because this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of massive changes that are going to be coming over these next three, four or five years. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time on this Labor Day. And uh, uh, actually, my final, my final comment I'll make about that is uh, uh, my time in the car business was uh, 363 days a year, 364 on leap years. Nobody closed except for Christmas and New Year's. And the odd person was open on, on New Year's. But the big trend I'm noticing today is a lot of dealerships are closed today and good for them. So, Ian, I'll leave it to you to close the show. Yeah, just thanks very much and have yourself a great week.
and enjoy some of that Labor Day. Hopefully you can get some fruits of labor in. And thanks for being on the show. Here we Thank go. You. Thanks for joining us. It was a great show. And follow us anywhere you would like on your favorite podcast, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and of course on our YouTube, or subscribe to our own channel. Have a great day. Thank Thank you.